Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call the September 18th, 2019 board meeting to order and remind everyone to please use your microphones when speaking and turn them off when finished. Thank you. Commissioners present are Commissioner Sanders, Commissioner Schmidt, Commissioner Doan, and myself, Commissioner Bagnall. Commissioner Duggan is ill this evening. So first, we will turn to reports by the Chief Executive Officer and Management Staff. Thank you. Uh, we're going to start tonight with uh, our safety minute um, pre presented by Tim Bullen. Uh, he's our IT services director. Good evening, President Bagnall and Commissioners. So this evening, I had the brilliant idea to talk a little bit about situational awareness. Um, and partway through developing this, I, I understood that our esteemed council talked to you a little bit about situational awareness last month. So I'm going to talk about situational awareness, but with a bent on technology and safety and cybersecurity. So as it's been described before, situational awareness is largely being able to understand what's going on around you, paying attention to your surroundings, paying attention to both what's going on with your situation as well as what could happen to those around you. We've all seen a lot of folks around town who have very little situational awareness. My big pet peeve is when you get into the grocery store express line and there's somebody with 85 items. They're just not paying attention or they don't care. But having situational awareness not only affects your existence, it affects those that are close to you. One of the things I wanted to talk a little bit about tonight is situational awareness when it comes to your technology use. So not paying attention to things that cross your path, things like emails, things like people calling you on the phone, things like people showing up at your door, um, Failure to pay attention and understand and process what you're seeing or what you're experiencing can lead to really serious consequences. Here at the district, we get continually bombarded by phishing emails or attempts to gain access to our systems. It's the diligence and situational awareness of our staff that largely keeps us safe. There are some very, very uh, common sense frameworks to help think about maintaining security and safety and your situational awareness with your electronic life. So one of the techniques is, is the SLAM technique. Stop, look, assess, and manage. This applies whether you're working on a job site, working with a heavy piece of equipment, or walking through a city as you're a tourist, as well as with your digital and, and online experience. So from a, a stop, the, the key there is just don't rush through an email, don't rush through a form, don't rush through a website. Pause and really pay attention to what's going on. This includes looking at the website address, this includes looking at the email address of somebody sending you a document, it's paying attention to whether or not you know this person or expect the document. It's, it's calling time out and giving you a chance to really look, which is the second step. That's look at the details and consider them instead of trying to move quickly. The third one is really assess. And what this, what this boils down to is assess the likelihood or risk that what you're seeing is what you've been presented. Here at the district, we often get phishing emails that come disguised as being from our vendors or even folks that, that work on our team. However, when you look closer, it's an odd email address or it comes from an email address with a foreign country extension or it's a website that's slightly misspelled. So really assessing the validity of what you're seeing um, can keep you out of a significant amount of trouble or those around you. The last one is manage. If you're unsure whether it's in your personal life or in your, your work life, reach out for help, whether it's actively going to pursue questions on the internet, reaching out to folks who uh, are experts in the field like an IT or a company help support desk. Um, 
the, the goal is you don't have to work through the situation on your own. There are people out there willing to help um, at a moment's notice. So if there's any question, stop, look, assess, and if there's still question, go get help before you click on something. Pretty common sense. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm recalling that uh, young lady that lost a leg on the TriMet tracks. She had a hood on, sunglasses on, listening to music in the earbuds and walking across the tracks looking straight ahead. So uh, as far as the rest of the uh, management staff report, um, somewhat uneventful. Uh, we have, uh, there were no reported detections of cryptosporidium in the water samples collected from the Bull Run headworks during the past month, which is great news. Um, on the not so good news side, uh, uh, water sales, uh, this unusually cool summer and fall has result, resulted in lower than what we had projected in terms of uh, water sales. Um, we don't fully uh, understand the financial impacts at this time and probably won't till November timeframe. Um, but I did work with our CFO, Paul Matthews, to uh, do a forecast of what they could be. And uh, based on that forecast, uh, there's a projected range of somewhere between three to three and a half million dollars of a potential shortfall, or somewhere between four and four and a half percent of the total budget um, in terms of uh, less revenue than what we had originally forecasted. So um, not ideal, but uh, it, that's always one of those things that we just can't change and we can't project uh, 100%. Um, and then lastly is the CEO transition process. Um, so it's nearing its end. Uh, I think I've been here now a month and a half, uh, somewhere in there, maybe two. Um, and uh, Mark has uh, completed uh, providing a draft of the operations plan outline um, for the WWSS, uh, along with uh, position descriptions for managing the w WSS. Um, we, as a, a management team, are reviewing those um, and having discussions about those and really looking at the timing. Uh, when do we need those positions? Um, what do we need today versus what will we need when the project's fully up and running? Um, Mark has formally submitted his resignation letter uh, with his last day being October 4th. And uh, more than anything, I just really want to thank Mark for his mentoring over the last two months. Uh, it has been very helpful. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn this over to Tim Bolin again for the department report for IT. And good evening, commissioners. <laughs> um, I'm excited to, to come back and chat with you a little bit tonight. It's been a while since we, we had an update on what's going on with the IT department. And uh, we're, we're at a really exciting space with what we're doing and where we're going. So. What I'd like to do tonight is touch base a little bit on what our strategic objectives are right now. Um, some of the actions we took since the last time I chatted with the board about setting IT up in the framework in which we're going to operate. And then I want to talk a little bit about a couple of the, the completed projects and things that are in the queue, give you a better feel for uh, the portfolio that we're working on right now. So the, the first slide describes um, in a nutshell, our strategic objective. Uh, I just celebrated my two-year anniversary last week uh, with the district, and when I came in, we had a lot of folks that were doing really great work, but not in a super structured or focused manner. Um, everybody was doing great things, but not in a predictable, uh, organized way. So one of the things we started doing last year was really talking about what the mission, vision, and focus of the IT group is. And what we settled on are four main pillars of, of strategic focus. And those are listed up here. They're the maturity of how IT delivers IT services. They're the simplification of our technology stack to make things a little bit more streamlined. They're adding resiliency into our, our district and our infrastructure. And then finally, really expanding and trying to drive a better customer focus. Um, quite frankly, IT is not about the technology. It's about enabling the district to do its work. 
So we adopted these four pillars and all of our initiatives and all of our strategies and all of our activities tie back to one of these four things. And if we're, in, if we're asked to do something that doesn't align, we really take a hard look about whether that makes sense. So the last time I came and talked with the board, I had outlined a plan to move forward with setting up IT uh, based on industry best practice. We use ITIL, which stands for IT Infrastructure Library. It's a, it's a standard used around the world for setting up, managing, and delivering IT services. Since I last came in, we've ticked off three of our four phases, and the last one is right on the cusp. The first phase was really defining what we do and how we do it. The second one was really getting a handle on our standards, our inventory, and what we want to do from a technology roadmap looking forward. In other words, we spent the first part of this journey understanding who we were, what we had, and where we needed to go. That was our jumping off point to allow us to really start targeting projects, activities, and support for the district staff that would really make a difference. We started working on phase three and four in parallel because they weren't required to be staged a certain way. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more on the next slide about our self-service. The last thing we're working on in phase three though is our change management. The first part of this journey was to really understand our assets. That's what software the district owns, what devices the district owns, what, uh, how folks use those, what our licensing was, all those elements that make up our technology infrastructure. Once we understood those and had those documented in a database, then we can implement change management, which is every time we make a change, introduce a new computer, retire an old technology, it ties back to the inventory so we always have an accurate assessment of where we are. We're working through that change management process right now. In the IT world, it's estimated that somewhere between 70 to 90% of IT or technology failures are the result of some kind of a change. Um, you know, I don't know if, if you've experienced it. Periodically, Comcast will try and update my cable box at 3 a.m., and the next morning, things just don't look or work right. You have to unplug it and plug it back in. Or if you apply patches to your home computer, sometimes it doesn't work as expected. It's a change, drives a negative result. So really managing how we introduce change into the district limits our chance that we're gonna interrupt the staff's ability to do their jobs and keep the water flowing. So that's the last big uh, hurdle that we need to, to overcome. And then I feel like we've got a really solid base on how we manage technology. And it opens us up to be able to really respond to requests from you know, engineering or customer service or finance. We're not worried about how we do our jobs. We're then opened up to help them. So the next slide I wanna show is an example of, of how this manifests itself. We started out with a help desk tool that went live about almost two years ago. Uh, it was roughly 20 months ago. Um, originally this tool was envisioned to be able to submit help desk tickets if you need something from IT. It was really clear that this was a great way to help other departments capture demand, capture requests, capture things that, that they were struggling to identify um, and track. So we started opening up our service desk portal, and as you can see here, all but three of those categories are now non-IT. So for example, if we see a problem in one of the restrooms, we can submit a facilities request and that routes to the facilities team. If we have a problem with a mapping technology, you can put a ticket in and that routes to our GIS team. We have our safety and security team. You know, if there's a concern about a door not locking or a fence being left open, those kind of requests route to the security team. So we've really expanded this to provide an opportunity for other departments to better communicate with the district staff, as well as give us an opportunity to really understand how many requests are coming in for different types of services. I ran a report this afternoon and um, since we went live, we have over 3,500 requests in the system. Um, the bulk of those, about a third of those, are for problems with software. But 
we've only gone live with things like the facilities and the safety and security queue within the last few months. And we already have over 200 security tickets and we already have over 130 facilities tickets. So folks have really taken to this and they're using it on a daily basis. Um, and it's getting folks better response and they, they know that their issue or their problem has been logged and they're getting those resolved in a, in a really nice expedited manner. So I'm, I'm really proud of the team for, for, for making this possible and then giving folks the support they need to, to keep it running. Um, and the goal is to expand on this as we go. We have additional requests for things related to our human resources process, um, to provisioning for other applications. So the goal is to, to expand this over time. The second success that I, I wanted to talk about is uh, a radio project that we recently finished. And we have, a ver we have a valuable asset in our radio platform, but it was not being utilized for a variety of reasons. We had problems with coverage. We had problems with the configuration of our radios. The range was horrible. Uh, what we did this past year is we took a fresh look. We got some folks engaged that are experts in radio and we, we revisited everything from the top of our radio tower to the servers that run the system. Couple interesting things we found. Uh, number one, and I actually have a prop I, I can show. Um, part of our coverage issue, we found about 90 feet off the ground near the top of that pole on the left, a 22 caliber bullet lodged in the cable that went from the antenna to the radio shack. It was shorting out the cable, so a big section of our our coverage and our, our strength was just evaporating due to this, this malicious activity. Um, it's a little tiny hole, so either somebody was very lucky or very good. Um, what we've done is we've now replaced our old directional antennas, which were designed to shoot radio signals specific directions, to the ones on the right, which are omnidirectional. It gives us much better coverage. Um, the goal was to try and be able to cover the entire district so staff, while they're out in the field, didn't have to worry about whether they had a signal. Uh, our tests were successful all the way from this office to Estacada. We were successfully able to talk on one of the radios with a clear signal all the way down to Estacada. So we're, we're very confident that we'll have solid coverage. There will obviously be little rises and, and bumps that may create issues. but. What this has done is now given us another tool in our toolbox to give to folks in the field that is not dependent on AT&T for cellular service, gives them flexibility to talk one-to-one -one or one-to-many, and allows them to now interact with folks with the fire department, the police department, clean water services. We now have the infrastructure that allows us to take those steps. What we're working on right now that the infrastructure is, is built is we're working on the programming and the logic that allows folks to talk to the right groups and the right channels. Um, but everything so far has worked out really well. We're super excited about the opportunities and now it's the practical application of that working with engineering and field customer service. Excuse me. Yes, uh, where's the physical location? It's up on top of Cooper Mountain. Okay, There's thank a, you. a spot up there and we own a small plot and it's fenced off, uh, chain link fence and it's a secured building and it's, um, it, it's above the bulk of the tree line. We have a little bit of area in the district that's on the other side of Cooper Mountain that's, that's not a super strong signal. Um, but uh, generally speaking, it covers the entire range. Thank you. And then finally, what I wanted to touch base on is, is a little bit about the project portfolio and what's coming. This is a graphic that I share with the, the management committee, uh, the Inter Information Management Oversight Committee each month. Talks a little bit about the projects in the queue and what we're working on and where we're going. The, the key takeaway from this is you'll see many of these efforts that we're engaged in, whether it's... Uh, getting circuits installed, getting software upgraded. The goal is to, to complete all of these work in process efforts shortly after the first of the year. That coincides with the time when our CIS vendor selection will move from contract negotiation into implementation. 
we're trying to clear the deck so that all IT staff are available and ready to support the CIS initiative. The two exceptions to that are the work that we're doing with the Willamette Water Supply Program to make sure that the technology stack is, is defined for the program, as well as security initiatives that come out of the America's Water Infrastructure Act assessment that we're currently doing. Those two will be ongoing efforts for multiple years. Other discretionary projects we're trying to wrap up and clear the decks. And then finally, I wanted to provide a little bit of heads up into four key initiatives that are, are pending. Uh, the first one is our meter sales software replacement. I, I spoke to the budget committee and the board a little bit about this during the budget process. The meter sales application tracks new meters from the time they're requested by customers through their provisioning through the time that they're live. This is a software application that is coupled with our utility billing system. It shares some of the same software base and database elements. So as we prepare to remove the utility billing system, we need a solution for this application. Uh, we've identified a replacement for it, and it's a commercial software product that integrates with some of our other technologies. And what we're doing right now is refining the budget value and the implementation details. And we expect to come back to the board to provide a little bit more information about this um, at a future board meeting. Um, the other one is, is, or the next one is, is exciting as well. Um, Tyler is the company that produces uh, our software product for finance and human resources. In support of the, the finance team, uh, we're gearing up to support them in the implementation of their content management system. This is going to allow us to digitize and remove a tremendous amount of paper from our work process. This is digitizing things like invoices, checks, receipts, things of that nature, and they'll all get stored electronically, so they're there for easy access and hopefully reduce some of the, uh, the, the filing cabinet footprint we have in the office. Uh, and then the next two are really related to field operations. I mentioned the radio system. The next step in that journey is to figure out how best to use radio, mobile technology, and the, our existing software applications to give folks in the field an opportunity to be more efficient with their work, for us to better understand and track and manage that work, and then give us some actionable information that will ultimately feed into our, our financial systems and some of our forecasting. And with that, that is the end of my update. I'm happy to answer any questions. Questions from anybody? Thank you, Tim. Right, thank you. Moving next to Commissioner Communications, reports of meetings attended. Why don't we start with Commissioner Doan? And if you have any information in particular on the, the WIF Commission, please do report on that. The Willamette Intake Facility. Okay, uh, <clears throat> I, I attended a rate meeting on uh, uh, August 29th. The Aloha Business Association last Thursday. An earthquake seminar last Thursday. Uh, a workshop on uh, current uh, Technology and Engineering on Friday, the 13th, and then today's meeting. Thank you. Commissioner Schmidt, would you like to go next? Yes. Uh, I have all two. I attended the agenda planning meeting with Tom and Bernice and tonight's regular board. Thank you. And Commissioner Sanders, if there was any news from the Willamette River Water Coalition, that would be a good report. And anything else you've attended? Uh, we have not met in this last month. Uh, I only have one meeting to report, and that is tonight's board meeting. Short and to the point. Slacker. <laughs> well, I have several meetings to report. On the 22nd of August, I attended the 
West Side Economic Alliance breakfast, where Commissioner Schrader was the speaker, or Congressman Schrader was the speaker, and that was really very interesting. On the 24th, I attended the rate open house, where we got some really good customer input. It was well attended. On the 10th of September, I had the breakfast meeting with Commissioner Schmidt and our CEO to do agenda planning. And later that afternoon on the 10th, I had a JWC executive committee meeting where we were looking at uh, the lawsuit settlement that all the board is aware of. And then tonight's meeting for regular district business. Do we have any topics to be raised by commissioners? Okay, moving right along. This is the public comment period. Public comment time is set aside for persons wishing to address the board on items on the consent agenda and matters that are not on the regular agenda. Additional comment, public comment will be invited on agenda items as they're presented. I want to thank the customers who took time to provide comments during the rate hearing and the public comment process. TVWD supports public participation. In order to sustain a positive workplace, TVWD promotes an inclusive public comment process that is free of harassment, including abusive or foul language. The board supports staff taking actions to end communications with individuals who are abusive. We will continue to provide and expect respect during all interactions with our customers and to ensure that concerns are heard. Do we have any people who want to comment? <laughs> Seeing none, I will move to the consent agenda. Consent agenda items are considered to be routine and may be enacted in one motion without separate discussion. Any board member may, be, may request that an item be removed by motion for discussion and separate action. Any items requested to be removed from the consent agenda for separate discussion will be considered immediately after the board has approved those items which do not require discussion. We have only one item on tonight's consent agenda, and that is approval of the August 21st, 2019 regular meeting minutes. Do I have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda as presented? So moved. All second. Thank you. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes. Moving now to the business agenda. The first item on the business agenda is to consider adopting Resolution 24-19, a resolution establishing water rates and other service charges for the Tualatin Valley Water District with an effective date of November 1st, 2019. Our CFO, Paul Matthews, will do the staff report. Good evening, President Bagnall and Commissioners. Tonight, I'm here to present information on the proposed rate changes the district, to the district's water rates and other charges. The information I'm going to present tonight is an abbreviated version of the information I presented at the open houses as well as to you at uh, your August 21st uh, public hearing on the water rates. So we'll travel through this information a little bit quickly tonight since we've covered this uh, information previously. First, I want to start with the uh, district's rate and financial management process. Uh, the district maintains a 30-year financial plan that forecasts our capital needs, our operations needs, as well as our borrowing needs over a 30-year period. And that allows us to forecast rate increases well out into the future. We use this uh, to present information, the impacts to the budget committee and to the board of particular budget proposals that we may be proposing. So we work through the financial plan with those budget proposals and present that to uh, those bodies. We then present and prepare a budget, uh, present that to the budget committee as well as the board and the public for its approval. Finally, we recalibrate the financial plan again after we've got the final budget adopted and project rates. The rates that we're talking about tonight are the result of the, the adopted budget being recalibrated and the rates that we are proposing. So we're at the last of two steps. Uh, one is to propose rates that will satisfy the requirements of the financial plan of the budget. And then the next part, of course, is to deliver to our customers on the mission to provide the, our community with quality water and customer service. The district has, for many years, a policy to pursue multiple sources of water to reduce the risk that a major catastrophe could leave our citizens without adequate high-quality water. Uh, currently, the district sources 
include river water from both the Bull Run as well as the Tualatin Trash System, stored water in reservoirs, uh, both at Bull Run as well as Barney Reservoir in the Coast Range and Hag Lake. In addition to its service sources, the district also accesses groundwater, both through its contract with Portland, the Columbia South Shore Well Field, as well as our own aquifer storage and recovery well near uh, uh, Cooper Mountain. Uh, we maintain contracts with the City of Portland to purchase wholesale water, and we're also members of the Joint Water Commission, joint owner of that. So in addition to maintaining those sources of supply, the district also maintains a very aggressive conservation program. Uh, we use that to take water that might otherwise be wasted and put it to beneficial use. We include that as part of the district's portfolio of water savings. In fact, this has been very helpful to the district, the conservation that we've had over the past years, to allow us to delay the expansion of our current water supply system uh, and save us quite a bit of money by letting us do that over time. Multiple sources are, into, are very important to the district because we have various threats here in the region, some of which uh, all utilities, local utilities have. First of all, the Cascadia Subduction Zone earthquake, something relatively new to us uh, in the last several years, decade, I guess, or more. Uh, the district is susceptible to these large earthquakes and we have to plan for that. Multiple sources of water helps prevent and mitigate those problems. Drought, climate change, those are also risks to the district that multiple sources of water helps us to avoid. As we went through the strategic planning process and the financial planning process and the uh, budget process, there were three primary strategic investments that the district was tasked with. First was continuation of the Willamette Water Supply Program, and I'll talk more about that just in a bit. The other was maintaining TVWD's current infrastructure as well as operating that infrastructure. And the last item that we have here is the customer information system. Uh, this is a joint project we're doing with Clean Water Services to replace the district's billing system. And I take just a moment to highlight that the rates we're proposing here tonight are not related to Clean Water Services. That is a separate agency with its own board of commissioners that sets sewer and stormwater rates. As we've gone through the public comment period, we've actually received quite a few comments that indicate some of our customers are somewhat confused about the role the Clean Water Services plays versus TVWD. So I wanna make it very clear tonight that the rate proposal that we're talking about here is only for the water and does not include anything with sewer or stormwater. That's either with Clean Water Services or in some cases the city in which our customers live. So I'm gonna talk quickly about the Willamette and Tualatin Valley Water Supply System. Uh, the Willamette Water Supply Program is uh, an important part of our system and strategy of developing multiple sources. The overall goal of the project is to withdraw water from the Mid-Willamette River near Wilsonville, convey untreated water to a state-of-the-art treatment plant near the city of Shorewood, then deliver the treated water through large diameter pipes to users in the Tualatin Valley. Uh, this undertaking is in a joint effort, a large partnership that includes our principal partners at the city of Hillsborough and Beaverton. There are other partners in the region that are assisting, but those are the two principal project partners. One uh, important point I'd like to make is that so far to date, 96% of the money spent on the Willamette Water Supply Program actually has been with uh, local employees, goods, and services. This picture that we see here is of a large uh, diameter pipe being fabricated at Northwest Pipe in North Portland, right here in our Portland area. Uh, that pipe is being fabricated and delivered to the Willamette Water Supply System. In addition to the Willamette Water Supply System, we also have to maintain the infrastructure that the district has and operate that infrastructure. The district uh, provides about 23 million gallons of water per day to our citizens. Uh, we need to have the capacity on a peak day to deliver about 42 million gallons of water per day. Uh, we do this through 750 miles of pipe. Uh, we use 13 pump stations, 23 reservoirs with a combined storage capacity of about 67 million gallons. Uh, these storage reservoirs and the pipes are important not only to provide water to our customers, but also to provide adequate firefighting water to our first responders. We serve a population of about 228,000 people, as well as the businesses that support our local economy. In total, we deliver about 8.5 billion gallons of high quality drinking water in a year. I wanna make one additional comment on the water quality. It's very important to the district. We have a continuous program 
of water quality monitoring through 140 sampling stations that are throughout the district. Uh, so it's an important part of our overall service strategy. Coming back to where our financial management process, uh, we are now completing the last half of this. We're setting rates that will recover the money that we have outlined in the budget and the financial plan and setting ourselves up to success with the delivery of the 8.5 billion gallons that we just talked about. Before I get into all the details, I want to give you a brief recap of how we ended the last biennium. Our operating expenditures were below budget in the past biennium. Our capital expenditures were, for the biennium were also below budget. Our water sales revenue in the last biennium exceeded projections. Now we heard tonight from uh, our CEO that this year we're, we're falling behind. We have adequate reserves to cover that. This is the water business. We understand that that can happen from time to time. But last biennium, our water sales revenues were, were above projections. Sys development charges also exceeded projections. And sys development charges are one-time charges that are assessed on new connections to the district system so that growth can pay for itself. And those have come in over budget. The expenditure of those funds are restricted to capital projects and we maintain that uh, segregation of those funds. Uh, so finally, the last part of this, we are in fact having higher cash balances than what we had planned. That's a result of having revenues above plan and expenditures below plan. So we're starting the biennium in a very strong financial position. Presented here are the, um, is our capital improvement. This graph presents our capital improvements that we expect over the years. This is the investment in the district's infrastructure. Uh, the blue area that we see here is for the land water supply program. The gray area is for the in-district CIP. Uh, as you can see, the district over the next 10 years is planning spending about a billion dollars on infrastructure. We're going to fund part of that with, with long-term debt. Uh, the bars that you see presented here are anticipated uh, use of long-term debt. The shaded area is money that we have from our, our WIFI loan, the uh, Water Infrastructure Finance and Innovation Act loan that we received, and uh, the white areas would be from traditional revenue bonds. The uh, customer impacts that we are projecting uh, over time are presented here, both uh, with um, inflation with the light blue and without inflation are the gray bars. Those are the projected bills that we, that we have. Uh, if you were with us two years ago in 2017 when we presented our rate forecast, uh, we had actually projected rate increases of about 8.8% over the, uh, the period of, of time that we're looking at here. After getting our WIFI loan, we were actually able to drop that from 8.8% down to 3.6%, which is our current estimate. That's a rather dramatic drop in the um, forecast of future rate changes. And you might uh, ask, well, how, how could the WIFI loan make such a difference in our rates? And what we presented here, the impact that it has on our debt service. So our debt service is the amount that we pay in principal and interest uh, to borrow money. In 2017, before we had the WIFI loan, we were anticipating having debt service during the construction of the WWSP program of about $213, $214 million. With the WIFI loan, the way we're able to restructure the debt so that we're not amortizing principal during uh, the life of the loan, that's reduced down to 67 $6 million. That's a large savings. And that allows us to do two things. First of all, keep our rates lower and actually borrow less money by preserving the capital for investment in infrastructure rather than to use for debt service. With every forecast, there are risks. And uh, this forecast includes risk, and we monitor them very carefully. So the rates that we've proposed and that we're showing going out in the future are subject to those risks. Uh, I've got some of them listed here. And of course, we monitor these things very closely. Our purchase water costs can be higher, and we monitor that. Uh, that's through our relationship with the city of Portland. We're also looking at uh, construction costs, future interest rates, a little bit less of a risk now that we have our WIFI loan in place. Uh, but those are the risks that we're looking at. Also, we're looking at opportunities, ways that we can continue to uh, save the ratepayers money. In fact, two years ago, one of the opportunities we had listed here was applying for and receiving low-interest loans through the WIFIA program. We were able to find that and have substantial savings. 
Uh, we will continue to look for savings in the program uh, to see if we can lower the overall cost to our customers. So the rate proposal itself is presented here. Uh, the district has a two block rate structure, meaning that um, water priced uh, at the first block is for consumption for single family residential customers up to 14 CCF per month. Uh, water over that 14 CCF per month is at the higher block two rate. Uh, for commercial customers, that threshold is 140% per month. Now these thresholds and rates were developed to achieve the board's cost of service uh, policy, which is that customers pay in proportion to the cost of serving them. Customers who have higher peak demands in the summer months actually are more expensive for the district to serve, and that's why that rate is set at a higher rate. In addition to the volume charges, we also have fixed monthly charges, which vary based on the size of the meter. Uh, these are presented on a monthly basis. Many of our customers are billed on a bi-monthly basis, which case would be just twice this amount. We look at the impact on a typical customer. A typical customer at the district is one with a single family customer with a five eighths by three quarter inch meter that consumes seven CCF of water. About 63% of the single family residential bills that the district issues have seven CCF per month or less in consumption. Seven CCF, uh, 748 gallons per CCF or 100 cubic feet, that's about 5,200 gallons per month. As you can see, the proposed change in the typical bill would be $1.90 per month in November 2019 and $1.99 in 2020. We present this on a monthly basis, even though many of our customers are billed by monthly, so they can compare it to other utility bills that they receive um, more often on a monthly basis to make that comparison easier. We also have prepared an impact for above average customers using 12 CCF per month. That's about 89, about uh, 9,000 gallons per month or about 300 gallons per capita, uh, 300 gallons per day or 100 gallons per capita per day. So this is a um, above average customer. Monthly impact would be 285 per month, November 2019, 299 in November 2020. We also looked at a very high uh, use customer. Uh, fewer than 3% of our single family residential bills actually have this much uh, water use. Uh, 28 CCF for this high customer, it's almost 21,000 gallons per month or about 700 gallons per day, which is about 230 gallons per capita if you have a household of three people. That's about $7 increase per month in 2019 and $7.31 in 2020. So following the district's cost of service uh, policy, we also look at other fees and charges that the district assesses to make sure that those are priced fairly to customers. And again, the goal here is to make sure that no customers are subsidizing other customers and everybody's paying their fair share. The district recently uh, completed an indirect cost allocation plan uh, to look at how its overhead costs are shared to various programs. Many of the changes that you see on this sheet are the result of two factors. First, the incorporation of the indirect cost allocation plan and an estimate of the, the time required to complete the various tasks. So we're proposing the changes that you see here. All these changes were included in Exhibit B to the proposed resolution. In addition to that, based on the recommendations from the district's rate advisory committee, we're actually changing how our bulk water fees are charged. Currently, our bulk water fees are charged um, based on the length of time of the permit, and then they self-report the quantity of water that they take, and that water is then charged at a block one rate. We're proposing that for tanks that are smaller than 2,000 gallons, that they be charged a fixed amount uh, to recover both the cost of the the cost of uh, of the permit as well as the water itself, we're also recommending changing the penalty for unauthorized hydrant use, uh, so that on the first offense in a 12-month period would be thousand dollars, the second offense would be two thousand dollars, and the third offense in a 12-month period would be four thousand dollars. Penalty for using unapproved inspection ta un inspected tank rather would be two thousand dollars. For those customers with uh, tanks over 2,000, we're actually moving them to a new hydrant meter fee. 
Uh, there would be a $510 administrative fee, which would pay for the cost of setting up the, the hydrant meter, ensuring that the backflow device on the meter is in place and working appropriately. Uh, customers would then be charged based on the use uh, of the fee, uh, the use of the water at uh, the block one rate and on a daily basis for the rental of the hydrant to recover the cost of the hydrant itself. Fire flow testing would be broken down in a little bit more detail. Currently, the district charges $235 for flow testing of a hydrant. Uh, the proposal is uh, to do actually break down to five different options, including one where the district would do it with existing information and not physically uh, spend time at the site. So based on uh, the analysis of our engineering group, these are the fees that would be proposed to recover for these additional fire flow tests. The last item I want to present tonight is a change in the SDC contract recording fee, uh, moving that from $290 to $500. That reflects both the change in the indirect cost allocation, the overhead cost, as well as the time required to complete those tests and temporary irrigation meter also. So with that, I want to just briefly talk about uh, the public outreach process that we followed. Based on the direction from the board at the July 17th regular meeting, staff conducted public outreach. Uh, we had two open houses, one on a Wednesday night, the other on a Saturday morning. You also had a public hearing on August 21st where we made this presentation. Uh, we received public comments up until August 28th. Uh, we provided those to the board earlier this month for your consideration and then tonight's meeting. Uh, in terms of the public outreach, we at the two rate open houses, we had 20 people that actually signed in and provided contact information for us. Uh, the August 21st public hearing, we had four people attend. Uh, in addition to that, an informal part of our outreach was through the Nextdoor process, which is a social media platform. We had 45 comments were made on two posts. Uh, TVWD's website uh, rate proposal page had 619 unique visitors, and on average, they spent two minutes and 29 seconds looking at that. Uh, we received 47 submitted online comments that were forwarded to the board, seven emails, also included in our packet to you, uh, two letters, and one written comment form from the uh, August 21st rate hearing. That concludes the formal staff presentation. Staff recommends the board adopt resolution 24-19, establishing water rates and other charges for the district. Thank you for your kind attention. I'm available to answer any questions you might have. Questions from the board? In that case, do I have a motion and a second to adopt resolution 2419, a resolution establishing water rates and other service charges for the Tualatin Valley Water District with an effective date of November 1st, 2019. I move. I'll second. Thank you. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And with none opposed, the motion passes. Moving to the next item on the agenda, consider adopting resolution 25-19, a resolution declaring public necessity to acquire permanent easements and temporary construction easements on tax lot 2S106 B000500 for pipeline section PLM 5.2 for the Willamette water supply system. Staff report by Chief Counsel Clark Balfour. Thank you, President Bagnall, Commissioners. Um, we will we will continue to try to make the titles of our resolutions as difficult as possible for you. Love Go. the tax law <laughs> numbers, especially. So what you have, you'll see two uh, resolutions on your agenda tonight. This is the first one. This is for the the property on 5.2 that we also commonly refer to as the Bartholomew property. Um, and you can see also in your packet as well as up on the screen, you can see where that property uh, is situated just west of the intersection of Shoals Ferry Road and Roy Rogers Road. Um, 5.2 is a portion of our transmission system that, that moves from that intersection and then goes west and that to Tile Flat Road, then heads northwesterly and northerly along Tile Flat Road. Uh, you have declared need for this uh, property in the past. We've had to do some uh, changes uh, in design 
that necessitates us to come back to you here and have a new resolution uh, to run, reaffirm the public need finding that you made earlier and then to uh, memorialize that we've changed our design, changed our location, and that we are ready to proceed. And if you see this, if, if you look, there's the, the red area, reddish area up there is the temporary construction easement. The green area is the permanent easement uh, that we'll need for our water line. So I think the staff report speaks for itself. This is something that's been before you uh, in the past. This is a reaffirmation of that de uh, declaration of public need and we'd ask that you adopt uh, resolution 519. Thank you. Questions? Then do I have a motion and second to adopt resolution 25-19, a resolution declaring public necessity to acquire permanent easements and temporary construction easements on tax lot 2S106 B000500 for pipeline section PLM 5.2 for the Willamette Water Supply System. I so move. Second. Thank you. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And with no opposed, the motion passes. And I will try not to giggle when talking about the tax lot number in this next item, item C. <laughs> I can't help it. They're just so long. <laughs> Consider adopting Resolution 26-19, a resolution declaring public necessity to acquire permanent easements and temporary construction easements on tax lot 2S2010800 for pipeline section PLM 5.2 for the Willamette Water Supply System. Mr. Balfour. Thank you, President Bagel. So, um, as indicated earlier, this is the second resolution on the 5.2 transmission line. And if you look at the map in your packet and also up on the screen, uh, you'll see that this property is to the west along Tile Flat Road. The parcel on Tile Flat really is bisected by Tile Flat. So in the northeast corner, there's this, what you would probably describe as a more remnant parcel. And that's on the northerly side of Tile Flat Road where the water line will be. And just like with the uh, previous resolution, you can see the area of the temporary construction easement in red, and then the permanent easement is in the greenish or yellowish uh, color. Um, <clears throat> as with the previous resolution, you had declared public need. Uh, we've had to make some adjustments to this in terms of the easement interest that we're trying to acquire. And in our view, we need to come back and adopt a new resolution that reaffirms that need uh, and designates uh, staff to go forward. So uh, we would ask that you adopt Resolution 26-19. Questions? You can get him. It's noisy tonight. Do we have a motion and a second to adopt Resolution 26-19, a resolution declaring public necessity to acquire permanent easements and temporary construction easements on tax lot 2S2010800 for pipeline section PLM 5.2 for the Willamette Water Supply System? So moved. I'll second all those zeros. I'm just jealous of all the people who could get, just get to say so moved. <laughs> right. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 With no opposed, the motion passes. And there being no further business before the Board of Commissioners, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone.